Okay. Um, okay, so welcome to the AMATIC 29 webinar series, uh, Pick Math and the Best Jobs in the 21st Century. Uh, our speakers are Michael Dorf and Suzanne Weeks. Um, Hi. Uh, the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. Commercial products mentioned by presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. Uh, we would like to thank McGraw-Hill Higher Education for their support for the webinar series. Okay, and I believe, uh, Michael, we got your slides there. Uh, let me give a quick introduction. Uh, Michael Dorf is president of the Mathematical Association of America. He's also department chair and professor of mathematics at Brigham Young University. He earned his PhD from the University of Kentucky and has given about 500 talks on mathematics. He's interested in promoting mathematics to the general public in non-academic careers in mathematics and in undergraduate research. Along with Susie Weeks, he co-founded the PIC Math Preparation for Industrial Careers in the Mathematical Sciences. Uh-oh. He is married with five daughters and any free time he has, he enjoys reading, running, and traveling. And also Suzanne Weeks is a professor of mathematical sciences at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. She's been director of WPI's Center for Industrial Mathematics and Statistics and has helped lead WPI research experience for undergraduates program in industrial mathematics and statistics for many years. She co-founded the PIC Math program with Michael Dorf and in partnership with the MAA and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics and is also a founding co-director of the Mathematical Science Research Institute undergraduate program in Berkeley, California. She holds a PhD in mathematics and scientific computing from the University of Michigan. So welcome to our two, uh-oh, did we lose Michael? Um, looks like we did. Looks like we lost Michael, uh-oh. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. Hopefully he'll be back shortly. Susie, you want to? Uh, sure. Uh, so, um, well, give me one minute. Let's see if I can pull up these slides and um, we can get going with that if need be. Okay, it looks like Michael is back with us. Oh, good. Welcome back, uh, Michael. Yeah, I don't know. don't know what happened. But, you closed uh, the wrong window, maybe? <laughs> no, I wasn't touching anything. I think I may have just been the internet um, okay. side or something. Well, we had just finished the introduction, so we, did, we only lost a few seconds. So whenever you're ready, you can uh, put your slides back up and begin okay. your presentation. All right, so here should be my slides. There we go. Great. All right, so let's start here. So one of the things that I've heard um, as I've gone across the US is uh, both from students and from, from uh, faculty members is the, the idea that what can you do with a degree in mathematics? And a few years ago, uh, CareerCast, which is an online um, job search web website, they listed the best job being a mathematician. And one of the quotes they had on their, on their website was, mathematicians pull in mid-level income of 100, over $100,000. Um, now, this may be discouraging for uh, people who are math professors, um, but this, the idea here is uh, that your students have opportunities uh, as math students uh, to get great jobs. So what are some of the non-academic careers available for mathematicians? So we're going to go through briefly some of these, um, these careers. And you may want to take a moment and just think to yourself, what careers do I know of that students can get? All right, we're going to come across some of these. And uh, Susie and I will kind of interchange talking as we go through these. Mm -hmm. So the first one I want to mention is uh, a data analyst or data scientist, um, also known as analytics consultant. And this, in my mind, is one of the biggest jobs right now, very hot area. And basically, this is, this is a type of job where um, there are so many companies that have lots and lots of data. And the, and the question is, is there a way that they can use this data to answer questions for their business, make their business um, more productive, um, venture into new areas? Companies that, that hire 
math students that have these skills um, are companies like Google, uh, Nike, NBA, or any professional sports teams, um, and even um, government agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, we the the picture up there of the two students were two of our um, two of our students who got job got internships at uh, NBA basketball teams, and so what happens there is the the over the court the basketball court they have cameras that record um, images and they collect the data and in, in the while the game is going on there's a back room where they have maybe a dozen um, data analysts or data scientists who are then analyzing the data as it comes in and then trying to give feedback to the team or to make predictions for future games things like that mm -hmm. okay another career is operations researcher and this is the idea of a of career where the the operations researcher is trying to make the company more productive. The classic example is UPS. Uh, it, it used to be that UPS, when they delivered packages, would give the driver a list of places they needed to go to. And the driver would just, just go and drive to those places. And later, they realized that there was a more productive way to do this. And so they developed a, um, a program, an algorithm, that they would then give that they would use and that would give the driver a specific route that they were supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that the algorithm told them to um, omit left-hand turns. And you may ask yourself, well, why, why was that? And the reason was by omitting left-hand turns, um, when, a, when a truck is waiting at a, like a stoplight, it uses a lot of gas. Um, and by omitting the left-hand turns, they were able to save um, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, throughout the company um, because of avoiding those left-hand turns. Mm -hmm. So those are, that's mm -hmm. an example. Yeah. And so the term operations research comes literally, so if you look at the phrase operations, right? Um, it's how to run your operations of more effectively. So when you look at airlines and hospitals, one thing you know airlines and hospitals need to do is schedule stuff, right? So if you're scheduling shifts at uh, a hospital or scheduling flights, takeoffs and departures, so those are places that can use operations research because you can look at that staffing and scheduling problem as um, some of you may have seen linear programming or nonlinear optimization, all these sorts of things. And then with military, getting materials from one place to the next, and the right kind of material or even beyond military, just storing the right kind of supplies. Where should you put your let's say your Amazon hub so that we can all get our, um, our purchases within a day or so. All that is part of operations research. Right. And uh, for example, this picture here of Eric Murphy, uh, he has a degree in mathematics, um, worked at the Pentagon, and he was an advisor for the Joint Chief of Staffs. So you have this mathematician who's advising the, the military on how to um, move troops, how to move supplies, food, water, and uh, and housing, and things like that, as as the military is going through, maybe moving through different uh, a hostile country or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really cool that that a mathematician, somebody with a math degree, is doing that. Okay, another career is a technology consultant. Um, and the companies that they could work for, Raytheon, which is an aerospace defense um, contractor, um, which interestingly enough, at one time they were trying to create the real Iron Man suit, as this graphic shows here. Um, my own daughter, uh, who has a, has a master's in mathematics, uh, her first job was with Raytheon, and she was working on GPS satellite systems. So using the math to analyze um, how to make a system more productive. Let's see. Then we have financial analysts, um, banks, um, anybody dealing with finances like to hire math students. And I think when I've talked to, um, to these different companies and businesses, what they say is they, 
what they really like about the math students is they feel comfortable about numbers, um, which, which maybe to us seems like common sense, but I guess there are a lot of people out there who just, they feel a little flustered by numbers. And, and students with good math skills have the ability to do that. And so companies like Goldman Sachs, RVS Global Banking, um, ING, which is a European bank I visited, um, Capital One, um, mm -hmm. and um, trading firms and things like that. Yeah, and even beyond, I mean, so being, there's some high level mathematics that's, allow, um, that's needed to do things like derivatives and come up with different instruments and analyzing liquidity and all these sorts of things. So at the, the beginning, at the introduction, John mentioned the WPI REU program in industrial mathematics and statistics. And over the years, we've done several, several pro problems and research problems that come from industry. Like I said, from liquidity to um, international trading and what's called rationality. So there's a lot of high level mathematics involving operations research or statistics or real analysis even that goes into doing the financial, um, the financial industry. Right. Uh, and last, last summer, I took a group of students, uh, about 20 students down to South America, and we visited some companies. And one of the companies we visited there was a, was a financial trading um, firm, and they had all this data. Mm -hmm. And they asked, they, they wanted to know if the students would be interested in trying to analyze the data to, um, to, to help the company um, answer some questions. Mm -hmm. And so it was just really cool to go down to, to a company, visit it, and they show us all this data. And as we're looking at it, um, what they were talking about was basically some derivatives, first derivatives and second derivatives from calculus. And the, and the students caught up on that and it was just like really cool for them to say, wow, you know, this is something we learned in calculus and, and it can help apply to the work that was mm -hmm. being done by the company. Yeah. All right. So one of the one of the things that we've seen, um, Susie and I have both talked to to lots and lots of um, people who math people, mathematicians, math students who have worked at companies, and um, one of the questions that often come up is why would they want to hire a math student, someone with good math skills? Um, this particularly, I remember the first time I asked this question was when I was talking with Raytheon who is an air engineering company. So I first thought, well, they're just gonna hire mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, but they were very interested in hiring math students. And so the question is why? And, and so take a moment and think to yourself, why do you think that these companies would want to hire math students? All right, well, here are some of the answers that I got from them. One of them is the problem solving skills. Um, anytime we, we have students are working on these math problems in classes, they're developing problem solving skills. Another one is the ability to abstract. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that I hadn't thought of, but that makes sense to me now, is uh, when they mentioned that the problems they work on are very complicated and um, the ability of the students have to take a complicated problem and break it up into smaller pieces and then solve the smaller pieces and put them back together again is something that they really prize. I think is very useful. Another one is ability, the ability to learn new things on their own. Um, society, the, the way technology is going, things are changing so quickly, what the students learn in their classroom isn't necessarily what they're going to be needed, needing to use when they get on the job, mm -hmm. um, not specific skills. And so the ability to learn something new on their own is a great skill. And, and as I've seen students working on math problems, they, they are able to talk to other students, they're able to go online to look and find help for things that they're doing. They're able to sit down and kind of work through the difficult parts of the problem. And by doing that, they're learning how to solve some of these things on their own. 
Let's see. All right. Uh, attention to detail. This was kind of an interesting one. And some of you may remember um, a few years ago, there was a, an incident where um, I think it was NASA sent a, a, a satellite or a probe out to Mars and it ended up crashing on Mars. Um, and, and the difficulty was that the, the uh, engineers working on the, on the, uh, the, the system, some of them had put in the American units, like feet and miles, and some of them had put in metric units. And because of that, they were off and the, the satellite or probe crashed into Mars instead of landing and, and collecting the information that it wanted to do. And that would be terrible. I mean, if you were in charge of that and there's this million billion dollar project and, and what happens at the end is it crashes and you don't get any of the results that you wanted, terrible thing to happen. Um, math students often learn how to pay attention to detail. Um, my daughter, when, when she um, got her master's degree, uh, she went um, and had five job interviews and four of, the, four of the interview places that she interviewed at gave her a job, uh, offered her a job. And at three of those interviews, three out of those five interviews, they asked her a question that's kind of like this. If you have a clock, uh, uh, not a digital one, but a clock with hands, and the time is 1.25, what's the angle between the hands on the clock? And you might think about that problem for a little bit. There's lots of little things involved with it. One is to realize that, that, there, that there's 360 degrees in a circle. Another is when, when the hand's at one and five, there's a certain angle there. But even more importantly is the idea that the hour hand, the small hand, um, moves as the minute hand, the longer hand moves. And so it's not exactly pointing, the hour hand is no longer exactly pointing at one when the minute hand is pointing at, at, um, at the time 25 minutes after. And so that ability to, to pay attention to that detail, mm -hmm. something that um, employers really like. All right, and then the last thing I, I have here is that, the, that math students often think of problems in a different way. And so companies like to hire students with different backgrounds. So at a, at a company, a technology type company, they won't just hire an engineer, but they'll hire maybe a mechanical engineer, a statistician, a programmer, a mathematician, maybe a physicist, because they all think of the problem a bit differently and they bring a different perspective to solving the problem. Okay, so those are some th reasons why employers have said they'd like to hire math students. Now the next slide I think is really important, and that is what do they recommend that all students should do, all math students? Mm -hmm. So think about this for a moment. Why, what, what should students do besides getting their degree, besides you know, turning in their homework, getting good grades, all those standard things? What should students also do? So maybe, maybe we can have um, some of our participants put some ideas forward in the chat. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah, so you can wait um, and we can collect some information from this. All right. So. So what do you think, yeah, what do you think employers have said to make students better prepared or what makes them better choices for a job other than, as Michael said, um, having turned their homework in on time or something like this? Let me just remind those in the chat room to change the two uh, before you type a message to all panelists and attendees so everybody can hear, uh, can see your responses. Right. So, um, so we're getting some responses now. So Curtis Nelson says programming skills, absolutely. Linear algebra from William. Um, um, Jonathan says communication skills, yep. Um, research experience, says Bori. And ah, I like this one from Stacy. that says try tutoring in order to learn to listen and to explain, that's great. Volunteer or intern, says Clifton, like a, with StatCom. And Boris chimed in again with learning statistics will be helpful. So these are all good. So keep them coming. Uh, organizational skills, right? But you, you mean some math students aren't very well organized? <laughs> <laughs> so this is good. I, I've seen that among math uh, faculty members. Right. 
Let's see if we get some more. Hopefully someone's furiously typing for the next, yep. Certificate courses um, that might give them the idea of jobs mentioned earlier. So taking certificate uh, and then Stacy's joking that she prefers and believes in organized chaos. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, let me, what does your list say, Michael? Yeah. So the first thing, so if this were, if this were family feud and, um, and I would say that the, the 99% of the 99.999% of the respondents said learn to code. So some programming skills that that is just really, really important for them. Um, almost every, every company or employer I've worked at at a company say that students really need to know how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, second, develop communication skills. You, mm -hmm. you guys got these right. I mean, you guys got all of these. This is good. And when we say um, good communication skills, Specifically, I've heard um, listening and writing or speaking and writing skills. Um, when you have, if, if you're dealing with a, a superior or a supervisor who doesn't have good mathematics skills, and you start talking to them in a mathematical language that they can't understand, that's just not effective. So being able to, to take a complicated technical idea and be able to explain it to somebody without the background in a way that they could understand it is a great attribute for um, a student to have. Yeah. The third one they mentioned was doing a undergraduate research project or some or summer internship. And somebody mentioned this, that was which is spot on, really good. And, and as I've talked to, um, to people at companies, what they, what they mentioned here is that um, this is kind of, not only is it dealing, well, first of all, it deals with teamwork often. So, the, so a student is working with a team, so they're learning how to work in a team, communicating, um, dividing up responsibilities, which is very similar to what it's often done in a work environment when they get a job. Um, but also the fact that they're working on something that they don't know the solution to. I, I don't think I'm divulging anything secret here, but all the homework, homework exercises or answers are available online. If, if you have use a textbook, students can go online and find all the answers, or they can even go into Wolfram Alpha and it will tell them how to solve the problem and write out the details um, and, and see things like that. So if they're working on a, a research project that, that has never been done before, or an internship where they're working on a, on a problem that hasn't been solved before, they can't go and Google for an answer um, to that problem. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, dealing with that, that uncertainty is a really good skill. So I'd like to say um, in response to a question um, about learning to program. So the question was that we got from our chat, chat venue, what programming language? And I'd like to say that it actually doesn't really matter what programming language in, um, in a general sense, because I think if students know how to do a for loop, um, an if then statement, you know, a while loop, a print, if they have the framework for one particular computer, uh, computing language or the, the next, they will be able to pick it up. Um, and they have the ability to learn a new one, but at least they have the logical framework for a computing line, for a, a programming language. For example, if a student knows how to do MATLAB very well, I think they can move on and with a little bit of training, um, they can get up and running Python. They may even be able to get up and running in C. Now there's certain, you know, like C, C++, that takes a little bit more work. But to say that C++ is a thing that students should use, or Python, everybody wants, or R, I think, if they know one, they can learn um, the next, it's good, right? And it, it absolutely depends on, I will say not necessarily the industry, but the company. There's some data scientists that swear by Python, and then there are others who say, I don't wanna do Python, I wanna do R, and I run my consulting business using R. But if you know one, you can learn the other. So yeah. at least they have some good exposure to that. And does, not, we're not saying turn them into software engineers, but again, if you can do, um, they have to be able to put something from thoughts and ideas 
into a code to execute it. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me add two, that comments, question. Two, two, um, two aspects of that too. Um, I was talking once to a company that, that's pretty much a software uh, company that, that hires a lot of programmers. And the, the guy was talking to me about the difference between um, computer science majors and math majors. And this is again, just his, his perspective on it. Um, but he was saying that um, his experience was if they hire a, a computer science student, a student who's got a really strong background in computer science, but maybe not so much in math, that they can program and they can write code really, really fast. They, um, if they hire, if the, the, their experience in hiring a math student is that they can't write the code as fast. It takes them longer to program it. But um, he said that when, when they do write the codes, the math students, the code often runs faster. So that's kind of one a different aspect of it. Another thing um, about this, once I had a student got, who was doing some interviews for a company and he was, they were interviewing him to be hired as a programmer. Um, and as he went through the interviews, the, the first there were some general interviews and then they got to a stage where they gave him a programming test. So part of, they wanted to know how, how do we know that you actually know how to code? And so they had developed, the, com the company had developed this online test that they would give to people that they were um, interviewing. And basically um, he had to log in with, with some security codes or something so they knew it was him. Um, and, then, and then they would give him this made up language. So the screen would show that this term would do this in this language, this next term would do this and so forth. And it was a language that they had made up so the student could, or the person that they were interviewing could not have known the language beforehand. Mm -hmm. and, then they, and then the next stage would be, they would give some code based on that language. So here's some, here's some directions. And the question was, what's the output? Mm -hmm. when, when this code is run, what's going to happen? Okay. And they would have several so there was questions, a, questions like that. So there was a question, how to demonstrate that, um, how should the student demonstrate that they learned to program? And I think that it is enough to say on your CV that I know how to program in such and such a language. But if you want to ramp it up a notch, um, you could do a GitHub and, you know, but that depends, that's different level of things. But to start with, it's enough to put that on your CV. But of course, the general rule is don't put things on your CV that you can't demonstrate if needed that you know how to do. So in that interview, for example, they may say, oh, how would you do such and such and just have some sense of that. All right, well, let's move on because- um, Yeah, let, let me, can I just comment to you? So that um, also, I think the example of that company hiring um, mm -hmm. using the, the online test is a way that, that uh, students would demonstrate also that they know how to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and then the last last thing they said is is um, learn about another discipline. So, if you're interested in maybe working something in in a biomedical field, then then have a little bit of background in that. It, statistics would be a good background too. So, those are the things that they mentioned. Okay. Uh, let's go on to some other companies or skills, careers. We mentioned software engineer already. Um, some of the companies, Fast Enterprises in Madison, Wisconsin, hired a lot of, um, uh, oh, sorry, Fast Enterprises is throughout the U.S. Um, they have um, in Colorado, Memphis, or some places I know that they have headquarters. Google, Epic, Epic is the one in Madison. Uh, mm -hmm. And MathWorks, Palantar, there's lots and lots of companies that will hire students with software engineering skills. And it doesn't have to be a degree or a significant background in, in computer science. Um, it can be math because math students offer a different perspective. Uh, medical science, scientist, um, they can, uh, Students with strong math backgrounds can be hired for these companies to help them um, as they test um, drugs. Um, we probably, when we look at, when we think of a drug, um, when you have that drug in your system, you, let's say you take a, a, a pill or you get a shot or something like that, part of that medicine stays in your body. It's not all gone within a, like a 24 hour period 
part of it has a resi resi residual effect that stays in there. And mm -hmm. so it's not a new amount each time you have a certain amount in your body. And that's where we get this exponential um, or logarithmic uh, um, algorithm that, that relates to it. And having the math background to understand that um, is a good skill. Uh, cryptanalysis, uh, National Security Agency hires mm -hmm. a lot of mathematicians. Yep. And actuary, which is one that we're all pretty familiar with. Mm -hmm. And last one I think we have here is a computer graphics imaging. Um, uh, animated animation studios are hiring um, students who can help deal with the math behind it. So all these big companies, Disney, Pixar, Digital Domain, they have research scientists who are working on these films to develop the animation using mathematics, programming, statistics, and things like that. And also okay. gaming industries, video games and things like that are also hiring. So I'd like to talk about some other um, places that you could look to see what opportunities there are for, for people with a math background. So, okay, so I'll turn this over to Susie. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's, let me switch this over. I'd like to share my screen right now. Let's go to one minute. Um, here we go. Good. So are you able to able to see this side? I want so yes. Yeah, it shows up good, Susie. Yes. So look, the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics has um, a location for the SIAM Visiting Lecturer Program. And this was made, the SIAM Visiting Lecturer Program is a list of people in the basically industrial mathematicians and statistician who have agreed to come and present and give talks to SIAM student chapters. Um, it, it provides a nice list for you to see where people work, what they do, at, at the website, right? So whether, and you're ever, doesn't matter if you're a SIAM student chapter, these are all people who love to go out and talk. So you don't have to be an official SIAM student chapter, but I just wanted to show you this resource so you can see some of the people. For example, right here in Massachusetts, UMass Memorial Healthcare, Elisa Rosales is a senior data analyst, um, a research mathematician working in, uh, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Bonita Saunders, in fact, she, um, she came out and saw us here at WPI, visited and gave a nice talk out there. You can see their background. Um, so some other people, let's see, right at the top we have um, Carrie Burke. She's, she was one of my, sorry to be scrolling so quickly. She works, she has a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Howard University and she works at Phillips 66. She's done a bunch of wonderful things at Phillips 66, so that she's another interesting person. And then um, I was saying to my, my children and my husband just yesterday, anytime, because my husband's traveling, there was a mention of Ebola, for example, he's going overseas. And I was saying, oh, that's Sara Del Valle. She's a researcher at Los Alamos National Lab, and she does work on epidemiology and all, the, all these sorts of things. So anytime there's a hint of an epidemic, I know that Sarah already knows about this, right? So those are all the, a bunch of interesting um, jobs that you have. So Science Visiting Lecturer Program has a profile of a number of people and a number of jobs. And the other thing that I, uh, while I have the screen, I'll just mention, you can go, if you just Google um, pick math, Google pick math, um, maybe pick math, oops, it knows me too well. If you just Google pick math, we'll, which we'll start talking about in one minute, and videos, you should get a link to an, our industrial math case studies, and you'll see some videos that give you some ideas of the sort of problems mathematicians, mathematical scientists work on in industry. Improving market strategies, that's about data analysis. Uh, animation for movies, building a better filter to catch muck finding the safest place to store nuclear waste. So that's another resource that you can use to get informed or share with your students, et cetera, to see how, um, how mathematics is used outside of academia and what are some job opportunities. All right, so now we'll continue with our 
um, presentation and we'll go back to Michael. Okay. Um, and let me mention too, I, I saw a question from Stacy, uh, what level of education um, should most of the, for most of these careers, bachelor's, master's, or PhD? Um, and and they, I, my experience is that they vary depending on the company and the skill. So um, for a computer programmer um, or a data scientist, um, I know of math students with a bachelor's degree that have been hired by companies uh, to, to work there. Um, for example, Epic and Fast are two companies I know that have hired um, a good number of our bachelor students who get a bachelor's degree. Um, I also know that in our PIC math program that we'll talk about in a little bit, some of the students who are, have taken that course and gotten a bachelor's degree have gotten hired in the capacity as a data analyst um, mm -hmm. for different companies. Some of the more technical positions, like maybe with an aerospace engineering firm, um, they'll look, they're looking more for a graduate degree, either a master's or a PhD. One of the things that's interesting, uh, I had a master's student who got hired by Raytheon and worked for them for a little bit, and then, then Raytheon paid for them, for that student, to go back and get a PhD. So mm -hmm. there's an option too. All right. So I think we should probably move it along a little bit more quickly because we're going to come up. We want to leave some... Um, even though we're answering questions be between, we probably need to leave some time. Um, okay. Questions. All right. Okay. So, so um, summary of the part that we've done so far, just some of the careers and some of the skills that students mm -hmm. have had. So let's talk now a little bit about a sample problem. Um, so here, um, Youngstown State, Youngstown, Ohio, was a, a city maybe uh, 40 years ago that had um, reached its peak population, um, and then with the decline of the steel industry, the, the city started losing population. Near the peak of its population, the police department had separated the city into different districts, and a, a police would have a certain beat in one of those districts that they would patrol, they would, they would cover that area and uh, deal with the crime in that area. But as the population decreased, then the population in each of those districts decreased and there wasn't an equitable dis, uh, distribution of the, of, of the crime and the activity in different districts. So the police wanted to redesign those districts, those police beats. And um, there was a there's a group of students and a professor who went to the police department. They got data from the police department and they said, we can help you. you know, give us this data. We'll get some data on the population, look at the situation, and so forth. And the students and the professor, um, mainly the students, looked at the data, worked on it for, um, for a semester, and came up with a, um, a proposal on how to redesign the, the districts. They presented it to the police department and to the mayor of the city and showed it to them. And the police department was so impressed with it that they accepted um, their proposal and they implemented their design to create the new districts, uh, the new police um, beats for the police department. And I think that's just a wonderful story, uh, something that was done um, where students can solve problems um, that are in society. Okay. So Susie, how about? Um, yeah, so if you would click, if can you just do all the clicking? Yeah. Through? So that um, story that Michael told, they were part of, um, that semester long course and that program at Youngstown State. So it was students from Youngstown State University. And, um, I see that Teresa Moore is from Youngstown. Hi, Teresa. Um, so that, so what we do is we want faculty, it'll be great. And faculty have a great experience taking, having their students work on real problems from industry. These problems can be solved by students have been working on such problems at any time, we have two-year colleges, four-year colleges, undergraduates really, working in teams. We talked about how great that is on a problem from industry. That's like a little internship um, and in, interacting with a consultant from industry to prepare students and doing these problems, prepare students for careers in industry. So, and so formally we call it PIC math. Can we click on the next slide? Yeah, let's see, there we go. So, Right, the PIC math program and PIC, P -I -C, 
preparation for industrial careers in mathematical sciences. So that's PIC math. And PIC, that's the goal of PIC math is faculty and student awareness of what opportunities there are for jobs outside of academia and to give students that research opportunity to work on these real problems to make them even more marketable and even more ready to hit the ground running when they've graduated. So um, this is a program of the Math Association, Mathematical Association of America funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Security Agency. And at PICMATH, we, um, faculty apply and are, are admitted to the program and we work with faculty we start with a, a summer workshop, a three and a half day faculty training workshop on how the program goes and how to interact with the industry. Then the faculty members go off and get a project for their students to work on in a spring semester research course. So in the spring semester course, the, um, the student teams will be working on a project like Youngstown State did for a company or you know police department, what have you. That's the, when the big activity happens for the students. And then we have the, the material goes out, the students submit their research report, a recording of their video. We, have, we get feedback from, from external reviewers. And of course, the students are communicating, students and faculty are communicating all semester with their industrial partner. But for example, in August, this all culminates the end of our PIC math year ends with the student session and the student presentations at the MAA Math Fest. So what is it, August 1st, maybe? Yes. A bunch of students, if you're going to Math Fest in Cincinnati, Ohio, we will have um, students from almost all the PIC Math um, universities from this year and the colleges present at the student conference at Math Fest. Yeah, and that will be on uh, the, the Saturday, the I think Saturday. August, mm -hmm. uh, August 3rd. Uh, from uh, it starts at 8 a.m. in the morning. Okay, good. Good. All right. So, um, so here's some of the results that we've had uh, mm -hmm. over the. This is during the first three years um, that we've done the PIC Math program. Um, we've had 107 faculty members participate at 100 over 100 different universities and colleges. Um, throughout the United States, different levels of, um, of types of degrees, um, and some HSIs and HBCUs have also participated. We're trying to reach out, part of the reason we're doing this, um, this webinar is we're trying to reach out more to community colleges. Uh, last year, uh, the year we're just finishing up, 2018-2019, uh, we had another community college participate, mm -hmm. and for this coming year, this coming academic year, Mm -hmm. I believe we have, is it four? Yeah, something mm -hmm. like that, quite a, quite a number. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we just, and so this data is for three cohorts of faculty. We have one cohort finishing up and presenting in Cincinnati, and we just brought in our fifth cohort. And so as Michael was saying, we have a number of two-year um, faculty members, two-year college faculty members with us, and so we'd like to do some more of that, yeah. So right. Just starting on our fifth cohort of faculty. So it's right. Mm -hmm. um, and um, during those first three cohorts, we had uh, um, over 1,400 uh, students participate um, with a, a variety of diversity there. Um, and usually this, what is done is there's, there's a course, and in these courses, it's the average um, number of students is probably around 10 students in, in a course. Um, during, during the course, um, all the students will write a paper about uh, describing their project they're working on, the problem, and their solution to it, and written in a way that it's um, suitable for addressing the, the interests of the company um, as opposed to maybe a more academic type um, paper. Um, they give presentations about this, and um, we have industrial partners that give the problems. So you can see the impact that some of that on some of the students. So you have the students that this was a stepping stone for my career. I gained valuable skills. And the PIC math program helped me get my first job. As I said before, we 
the companies, you know, we've interacted with companies and they like to see uh, an internship experience. Well, not everyone can get an internship. And sometimes you need an internship to get an internship. But doing something like pick math, do it, working on a real world problem, open-ended, on a team, that takes the place of an internship. So you're still staying at your university, you're doing this thing that's just as valuable. Next slide, please. Okay. And so we see um, Ellie Farnell, who was at Kenyon Scott College, small university in Ohio, that they have the same thing. They see their students. You see what she says. You can see the students getting that experience in team-based open-ended problems. And again, Tom Wakefield from Youngstown State that had his students being so excited and committed to that project with practical implications. And as we mentioned, the actual structure we have it can be ranged from five to 15 undergraduates in the class, active learning, working in groups, solving those problems. And the PIC math program, we don't just send you out there into the wild to do this new thing, but the workshop um, that we have at the, in the summer when you just start the program, we give you access to material. You hear from faculty who've done the program before. You hear from industry collaborators who've worked with PIC math and here, get their view on things. So you're going into this fully informed, fully armed. We provide resources, all these things, right? Yep. As we said, the students give a paper, they give a, they, um, give a talk, and here's some resources that we provide, right? Yep. So the pick math videos I've mentioned. And so we can see some other problems. You can go ahead. Um, another prop pick math problem, another industry problem, an online browser-based video website. So, you know, then they're ratings of the games, but we want to detect fraud, right? So I'm not getting, I, I don't have a video game. I'm getting all my buddies to, to rate it highly. So they want to be able to, it's basically anomaly detection, right? Which is um, a, broad, a broad thing that needs to be done in looking at data and statistics and data. When do you discuss, when do you detect anomalies? And in this case, anomaly, an anomaly would be an indication of fraud. Right. And this one's uh, similar to that type of idea. The Field Museum in Chicago was, uh, they were crowdsourcing a project to try to get um, the public to help um, analyze data. But, um, but it's when people enter the data, there, there's no guarantee that they entered it correctly. They may, they may have entered in a wrong answer. They may have done a wrong measurement. They may have misdiagnosed um, a color or something like that. And so they, a student group was given the data. Were they able to determine um, indications of, of when, a res when one of this crowdsourcing um, responses was actually accurate or not? And again, when we're talking about data here, we're talking about so much data that you can't print this out and look through it like on a spreadsheet. This would be enough data to fill um, a big classroom. If you were to print out all the data on pieces of paper, it would fill a, a entire classroom from floor to ceiling all the way through. So you can't just look through this data. How, but, but how could you write up an algorithm for um, a computer then to determine whether the um, responses were accurate or not. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about any of these? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. So you can see here all the different companies. It's quite a range from smaller companies um, to larger companies, um, medical societies, insurance. Um, well, Coca-Cola can't be huger than that. And a couple of police departments. And as I mentioned before, Los Alamos National Lab, they've also given us projects for um, actually literally the Ebola problem and some other disease related problems. Um, yep, so this is just more information. That was just a slide um, reminding you of what we said about the three day summer faculty workshop. But we're near the end. So let us know if you have any um, questions. And again, we'd like to acknowledge that this is a program of the MA and we're grateful for funding from the NSF, uh, two rounds of funding, and also for the to the National Security Agency. Good. So that's, that's what we wanted to present. Yeah, so we're open to questions now. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have any questions, um, 
you know, we still got about eight minutes left. If you will uh, type those into the chat, um, Michael and Suzanne can uh, try to answer them. You've got their email addresses on the screen if you want to contact them afterwards. Um, they, they seem to be very excited about this, and I'm sure they would love to talk to you if, uh, if you had questions uh, beyond, you know, the next few minutes. Um, I'll leave their contact up uh, for a couple more minutes, and then I'll put the uh, the final slides I have. Mm -hmm. So questions, type them in. <laughs> And so you, you apply to become part of the PIC math program and applications are usually due, what month is it? Let's see. I think it's the beginning of March. March beginning 1st. of March, okay. Right, you would apply to start. So if you apply by March of 20, what year are we? By 2020, then you would be joining us for the faculty summer workshop in May, June of 2020 and going along from there. And um, the workshop is a really, I think, a great experience. You, we bring in everybody um, together. We talk about how to teach a class. We bring in um, faculty who have taught the class before so they can tell you what they learned and how to do it. We bring in people from industry so they can um, tell you their experience of interacting with students and faculty. Um, and you know, we have dinners at our house and it's a great fun time. Mm-hmm, lots of fun. So it looks like we have some questions here. Let's see, let me scroll back down. I lost some of it. Yeah, so one, one question says, I assume the faculty training program um, provides right. examples to grade the students, like rubrics, projects. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and that's exactly correct. We, mm -hmm. we have um, all we have sample materials from from the past years that faculty members have developed for the classes they teach um, and so there are sample syllabi there are sample schedules there are sample rubrics for grading the projects um, all those things are um, available that we can share with um, people who participate in the program and I was also I and then I will two things I just posted something so usajobs.gov is a website to look for government jobs and that information. Um, and so for example, you were sent an email um, yesterday about this with this information. There are many jobs that say math, math from the ASA, many jobs that say mathematical statistician on usajobs.gov, but you know, even math, mathematics or quantitative skills related jobs, not just statistician. So the question, what from Asli, what kind of technology would you use generally to solve the problems are in statistics? Well, no, it, it varies, right? It could be R, um, Python, it could be MATLAB, it depends on, so there's no one language. One, it depends on what sort of problem there is, it is. And then if you're working with a particular company, the company may have a strong preference because they may say, um, well, what we use is R. And so, of course, they may want you to hand them something in R versus you saying, oh, well, our, you don't want to say, well, our university has MATLAB, so we'll give it, we will do it in MATLAB when they don't have MATLAB. So you will work with the company to do something that works best for them. But and, one answer. Okay. And another thing to, to consider, too, is, is sometimes people may, may think, well, gosh, my students are first and second year university students. Mm. Um, how could they solve these problems? Well, when we talk about solving problems from industry, it's different than solving problems, theoretical, abstract math problems. Um, you've got this problem, like let's say you had this Youngstown State um, Police Department problem where you're trying to redesign the, the police feeds. You don't necessarily need to have like an advanced math class to do this. Your students could do this if they are first year students, or they could do it if they're advanced math students. They could do it if they were in graduate school. The, so the answers that they come up with might be different, but um, the, the te technique and the approach that they use is important. Um, and, and that may vary also be, you know, the different background that the students have. What they want to do in a lot of these problems is come up, the, the, the company or the business wants the best answer that they could get in the time period they have. 
So mm -hmm. if you've got like a month to solve this problem, what's the best answer you can give, give us? Mm -hmm. So instead of saying that the answer is going to be 24.5, it's the best thing you can come up with in that time period. Mm -hmm. yeah, they want good solutions, not necessarily the most optimal or best solution. Yeah. There's not one right answer to this. Okay, um, Michael, I'm going to take over control of the screen okay. to wrap mm -hmm. it up. If uh, While I pull up these last slides, uh, if, it's kind of hard to get a round of applause in a webinar, but if you could uh, <laughs> thank Michael and Suzanne in the chat for their, uh, for their presentation today. Um, and let me... Thank you. Uh, so I want to say thank you for participating in today's AMATIC webinar. Um, if you are not a member, uh, we encourage you to join uh, at AMATIC. We, have a, we are on Facebook, AMATIC, American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges. Uh, it's a wonderful Facebook page to follow for those who use that. Um, we have our national conferences coming up in Milwaukee later this year, uh, Spokane, Washington next year. Uh, we do have more webinar opportunities, traveling workshops. Uh, we are looking for a professional development coordinator. Um, mm -hmm. So if you are a member of AMATIC and looking for maybe the next step up or uh, wanting to get more involved, um, you can consider this at amatic.org. Um, the recordings of this webinar uh, will be uploaded in a week or two, um, but previous webinars are located at the AMATIC website. Uh, and if you would, please take a moment to uh, evaluate this session. We've got a QR code that you can scan and go directly to it, or a uh, link if you want to uh, take a photo of that or jot that down and do it at a later time. Let me uh, add just one thing too. Sure. Uh, I, will, I will be at the AMATIC conference in Milwaukee oh, great. in November. So um, if you're there, feel free to come talk to me. I'll, I'll see you there, Michael. <laughs> Suzanne, yeah. I hope you can make it too. <laughs> um, okay. okay, are there any other questions for, for uh, Michael or Suzanne? I seem to have lost the uh, chat. Nope, it's still there. Okay. The chat's still active. Yeah, I'm nuts. No, the chat's still active. I'm still okay, I'm, yeah, Thank I'm you, saying, everyone. I, I, I can't see it, and I'm mm -hmm. sure I'm doing something wrong. Um, Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, are there any questions on the chat? I, I'm not able to see it from- uh, No, I'm, I'm monitoring and thank you okay. for all the thank yous. So. Okay. Well, I will go ahead and stop the recording, but if Michael or Suzanne are willing to stay for another minute, if there are questions, um, thank you again for attending. Um, and everyone- Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.